Okay, we're here. This is Bill Donahue with Discerning Truths. Thank you for joining me, even though you <laughs> try to confuse everybody with what I'm talking about. So um, I need to get through this introduction pretty quickly because Michael's going to pray for the nation at 1 o'clock Pacific time, and I want to be done on time. But for those of you who don't know, that I've been dealing with some problems in my neck and back, and uh, some of the medication they gave me is... <laughs> I'm going to blame the medication. I, I accidentally posted the uh, resurrection study that I did last Friday for today and uh, didn't catch it until almost the last minute when somebody said, oh, cool, a replay. So uh, we're here. We're going to talk about the doctrine of the Trinity. Where did it come from? Is it in the Bible? All kinds of stuff about the Trinity. But if you're new here, I brought it Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, typically on Mondays and Wednesday, I'm going through a book of the Bible. I'm taking a break from that because I'm trying to redo the first 18 streams I did originally, um, cleaning them up, creating PDFs to go with them. And then I'm going to get back in in the book of Romans when I'm done with that. But uh, right now we're on stream uh, 11 on the Trinity. And then on Friday, I normally do um, things outside the a book of the Bible, things that you won't be taught in church. This would normally be a Friday stream. But uh, like I said, I'm going to be repetitive. We're in stream 11. I'm going to go right up to 18 and repeat those over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, don't mess with me, hog. I'm drawing drugs, right? You know, but uh, we're here. And then on Tuesdays, they generally join Neo on her program. We had a great conversation uh, on Tuesday. It's always fun with Neo when she gets to push all the buttons and I don't have to mess with any of that stuff. And then, uh, so I love Neo. I like what she does. It's different than what I do. And, uh, but you're here. If at the end of the stream, and I'm not here to convince you I'm correct or whatever, what I'm doing here is to uh, try to share information. And uh, if you look at the information and say, yeah, Bill, you know, but this verse says this and you want to have a conversation like that that chat doesn't work for, just email me and I will I will reply. You know, I'm in a different time zone, so give me a minute, but I will reply to you and then we can go on from there. At the All my replays are on CloudHub. Uh, they don't use channel numbers anymore, but you can search for channel 217 or Donahue Papa, find it. And all the uh, replays, I'm at 369 videos. And like I said, I am deleting the old versions of the first 18 videos as they get redone. At the end of today's stream, all of my notes are going to go into a PDF and I will post them on the Telegram group, on the Discerning Truth group. You can download them, look up the verses, check the references, see if what I'm telling you is the truth. So uh, I always try to promote my good friend Michael Beatty. California. If you weren't there this morning when Michael told you about what's going on in the last few days, I'm not going to uh, take a thunder. Go back and watch the replay. Michael broadcast Monday to Friday, 5.30 a.m. Pacific time. And then on Sunday, his wife Linda joins him in the uh, thing. And Michael had an adventurous 48 hours and uh, what a testimony he gave this morning. So, like I said, you can find him on replay. Go uh, rumble or of uh, YouTube, look them up, find them, watch them on replay, and then don't forget to check them uh, at 1 o'clock today when he prays for the nation. So with that, I'm going to get into the study. The uh, The title of my study today is The Trinity. And, and it, you know, what's a proper definition of the Trinity? Is it three gods? Is it three and one? What, what are we talking about? The word Trinity is not used in Scripture, uh, but is the doctrine taught there? Right? I mean, there's a lot of words not used. The Bible is not used in the Bible. Right? You know? Did Paul teach the Trinity? Did the Anti-Nicene Fathers teach the Trinity? These are, these are church fathers before the Council of Nicaea. Or did Constantine come up with the doctrine and uh, impute it in the church at the Council of Nicaea in AD 325? Uh, what are some common Christological heresies? What are some wrong ideas, according to the Orthodox Christian Church? I mean, uh, Christian Orthodoxy, uh, not including our oneness brothers and stuff. But, the, uh, but what are those heresies concerning the Trinity? And that's kind of what we're going to look at today. And i got a lot to cover, so let's just jump right into the study. And uh, go here. 
And the reason you'll see this diagram or a diagram like it, I like this multicolor stuff because you know me and my colors, but it's a, uh, they're doing it because we're trying to make an analogy to a God who is non-analogous. And non-analogous means there's nothing in the world that we can compare God to. He's self-existent. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. Omnipotent, all-powerful. Omniscient, all-knowledge. He has all these qualities that nothing else in creation have. So how do you make an analogy to him? And the Trinity is one of those things that's not analogous. We don't have it. Know the triple point of water. Know the leaves on a, 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 a clover are not analogous for the Trinity. They are typically analogies for one of the or more of the um, Christological heresies. Normally, it's modalism, what a lot of them are there for. But if they help you to think about the Trinity, to use those analogies, that's fine, but just understand they're not correct and they'll all fail. And why does it matter that you have to have a proper definition of the Trinity? Because if not, you do like Dr. Hugh Ross had a wrong understanding of the Trinity and then came up with this big old extra dimensional deity to explain a definition of the Trinity that was wrong to start with. And then he comes into all kinds of theological problems because he's starting off with an incorrect definition of the Trinity. Okay, he did it for more than 20 years and hardly anybody in the church was noticing. Okay, so proper definition of the Trinity recognizes that each person in the Trinity possesses all the attributes of a distinct and separate personhood. That it's not one God putting on three different masks. It's not one person in three different roles, like father, son, and, and you know, husband, wife, and father, right? Uh, it's not, you know, the, the Son and the Holy Spirit are both subordinate their wills to the Father. That means they have distinct wills. You can't subordinate your will to somebody else if that other person is you, right? So they have that. And, and they're obeying the Father from eternity to eternity. Now, theologians debate whether the Son is eternally subordinate to the Father or is functionally subordinate to the Father or willingly subordinate to the Father. That debate proves theologians have too much time on their hands. I'll tell you right now, this is, uh, you want to get your eyes to roll back in your head, just start reading some of that debate. But the point I'm making to you is that the son has to have a separate and distinct will to that of the father if he's going to subordinate to it. So does the thing. This is just one of the elements of personhood. We could do that same exercise with all the other elements of personhood. The father, the son, and Holy Spirit are clearly described as distinct persons in scripture. But we're stuck with the unwavering truth that God is one. That is repeated so often in the Bible, it's not even funny. There's no gods before him. There's no gods after him. Neither are there any gods beside him. Okay? The, uh, God is, is alone, right? So it's a violation of the law of non-contradiction and therefore a logical fallacy to claim that something or anything, in this case God, is both singular and plural at the same time and in the same sense. And this is the error that, that Ross had because he, he thought that's what the Trinity claimed and he saw it as a logical uh, contradiction and then he went out to try to solve it. That is not what the doctrine of the Trinity teaches. It does teach that the God is singular and plural at the same time, but not in the same sense. And that's where... Uh, you know, people like Ross get it wrong and where a lot of people, uh, other people, teach error on the thing. The doctrine of the Trinity does not violate the law of non-contradiction because it doesn't say they're singular and plural at the, in, in the same sense while it does say in the same time, right? So an easy way to explain this, that God is one what? The, the what of God, the substance, the, the, the whatever makes God, God is the what. There's one God, one what. But there's three who's in that God. 
And William Lane Craig and I both took the Hugh Ross to uh, task on this stuff uh, in its extra dimensional theories on, on doing it. Uh, I did it from the point of view of a layman. Uh, Bill Craig took my arguments to a whole nother level and just destroyed them and then let them off the hook in, in a Philosophy of Christie article. And I asked uh, Bill Craig about it after, and I said, you know, if he was Joseph Smith or uh, Charles Taze Russell from the Jehovah Witness, we'd have called him a heretic. Why are you not calling Hugh Ross a heretic? Because he's teaching heresy concerning the nature of God. And he said, well, he's not a trained theologian. And I said, well, it was Brigham Young or, or Charles Taze Russell trained theologians? I don't think so. We don't give them a break. We start calling Jehovah Witness and Mormons cults because of their position on the Trinity. And then you're not going to call Ross a cult? Um, I get a problem with where we're going here. But the scriptures seem to present a paradox, and a paradox is an unsolvable problem in multiple places. And and with no um in no uncertain terms it says that there's only one God, right? There's no gods beside him, no God after him. But there are definitely two different persons and possibly a third person in the whole old testament who are described with the attributes of God. In the New Testament, the third person, the Holy Spirit, is more plainly shown, but he shows up in that thing. In the Old Testament, <coughs> Jewish theologians during the Second Temple period recognized that the Scripture presented two powers in heaven, in specifically passages like Daniel 7, 9, and Exodus 15, 3, and 23, 20 to 23. <coughs> they have this other person. Whoever he is, the God anoints, and God gives a uh, a title to, and this there's all these entries in in there about this this other person. Sometimes it'll appear as the uh, uh, captain of the Lord's host, the angel of the Lord. There's, there's different places where this this person shows up, and he's sent by God, but then he's worshipped, and nobody but God's allowed to be worshipped, right? You know. And then there are numerous plate entries in the Babylonian Talmud trying to explain away this belief in this uh, two powers in heaven. In fact, Jews uh, banned it from being taught uh, after Christianity came up because they could see how it was going to lead to the Trinitarian belief and, and beliefs about Jesus being God. And so, you know, I'm just including one reference here that you can go up to. There's a lot in the Babylonian temp um, Talmud that try to refute this, but if you look in the Talmud in Sanhedrin 38b, you're going to find them trying to argue against this two powers in heaven. Well, you can't argue against it if people weren't saying it was there, right? And if you'd like to lead more on this subject, the best book on this issue is by Alan Siegel. Siegel. He wrote a book called Two Powers in Heaven, Early Rabbinic Reports about Christianity and Gnosticism. Uh, this is a theological book. This is for scholars. Uh, my crowd, I think most of you could read through it without any difficulty. Okay? But I'm expecting that most Christians listening to me are going to be well aware of a couple of characters in the Old Testament. The captain of the Lord's host, the angel of the Lord, and being given those attributes. But for the people that might be tuning in that are... Um, of coming out of the oneness camp or, you know, any any of the um, sects that deny the Trinity, you're not going to necessarily be familiar with these. But when you get to Exodus 23, it talks about this special angel. He clearly is not an ordinary angel. An angel just means messenger. He's a special messenger of God. And he gets to forgive sins that only God can do. And he has, and he has an additional quality that Yahweh, God speaking, says, my name is in him. Name. And in the Greek Septuagint, that is, you know, that that name that you have there shows up a lot and as a physical presence of God. It's just like the logos that is there in in uh, memory and the, in the Aramaic Targums are all in the physical presence of God. So when you look at stuff, in, in the scripture, 
the deity of Jesus is evident from a number of verses, right? He's called God in Hebrews 1.8. He's eternal in John 1.1. 1, 1. He's the creator in John 1.3. In fact, in 1.3, he says he created everything that was ever created. So if I had a conversation with some Jehovah Witness at my door the other day, and I said, okay, create me a box and put uncreated things in there. Who belongs in there? Jehovah, Jehovah alone, correct? And then we're going to create another box. We're going to label it created things. Time, space, matter, energy, all the celestial beings. Everything goes in the created box, right? We agree. Where does the sun go? If you put the sun, the logos, in the created box, then according to John 1, 3, the logos created himself, which is illogical. If you put the logos in the first box, of uncreated things, then the Logos is Jehovah. And it, there's no way around it. John 1, 3 is a very powerful tool for your, uh, if you get a Jehovah Witness at your door. Okay. The Lord says in the Old Testament that there's no other salvation outside of Jehovah. But Jesus is called the salvation. Uh, he's omniscient in John 1, 48. Omnipresent in Matthew 18, 20. He's omnipotent in Matthew 28, 18. He's immutable. That means unchanging. All these big theological words, sorry. Hebrews 13a. He's just. He's the source of life. Only Jehovah is the source of life. He is love. He is truth. He is holy. And then he also sustains in Colossians 1.17. He forgives sin in Luke 7.48. He raises the dead in John 5.25. He judges in 5.27. He accepts worship in Philippians 2.10. He is Lord in uh, Matthew 22.43 and 44. And he sends the Holy Spirit. And he also says that he's going to raise himself. All three members of the Trinity are credited with acts only God did. One of them is creation. Right? You have God created. Then you have the Holy the Spirit moving on the face of the water in creation story. Then you say that Jesus created everything that was ever created. The Logos did, right? They're equated together, and they're given the same things. They also, all three, are said to have raised Jesus from the dead. The Father will raise him up. The Holy Spirit made him a quickening spirit. And Jesus said, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days, right? The names of Jesus prove that he is God. Right? He's called God in Hebrews 1 8, the Son of God in Matthew 16 16, the Lord in Matthew 22 uh, 43 to 45, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords in Revelation 19 6, the Alpha and the Omega, Revelation 1 7 and 8. And why this is important is you go back in the Old Testament and it says that God, Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, the four consonants, YH. WH or YHVH, right? Depending on how you run them, is the Alpha and Omega. He is the Emmanuel, God with us, in Matthew 1 23. And he is called the Eternal Father and Mighty God in Isaiah 9 6. All these things show that uh, Jesus was divine. So you had all these people come up with the idea that he was divine, but he wasn't really human, right? And uh, we're going to deal with those in a minute. In the following verses, there are a few reasons the church has determined the Holy Spirit has to be a person. Okay? In Romans 8, 1, 8, 16, the Holy Spirit bears witness. A force can't bear witness. Describes the Holy Spirit, the covenant, as a distinct person from God in Jesus. And then 1 Corinthians 2, 10, 11, attributes to omniscience, omnipresence, holiness. All these attributes of God are, are doing it. The Holy Spirit begets Jesus. The Father begets Jesus, but the Holy Spirit does in one, uh, Luke one thirty five, right? And then the Holy Spirit convinces men, and the Holy Spirit regenerates man, and the Holy Spirit comforts and intercedes and sanctifies. In in Ephesians four thirty, the Holy Spirit has feelings; it can be grieved and stuff. The Holy Spirit has a will. The Holy Spirit does teaching; it guides. These are personal attributes. These are not the attributes of a force. They're not God's active force. God's active force doesn't do stuff. And also Jesus says the Holy Spirit can be blasphemed. And the Holy Spirit can be grieved. Right? The Holy Spirit searches the deep things of God. 
Well, if he is God, what's he doing, right? You know, I mean, if he is the Father, he's the deep things of God, right? And then when you look at Acts 5, 3 and 4 and Matthew 28, 19 and 2 Corinthians 13, 14, they all equate the Spirit with other members of the Godhead. So you have the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, a.k.a. the Logos, and the Holy Spirit, they're all called God, they're all worshipped, they all have the attributes of God, and they all have the attributes of personhood, right? Now we're going to look at, did Paul teach the Trinity? Okay, we, we get hints at the Trinity in the Old Testament. We have some in the teachings of Jesus, but did Paul teach the Trinity? In the first and second Thessalonians, Paul makes little attempt to theorize about the Christology of the Trinity. It's merely assumed that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are ultimately one. You see that in 1 Thessalonians 1, 2-5 and 2 Thessalonians 2, 13-16. He then shows that the one God is in fact working in Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13-14 and 5, 18. Now, God can work in Jesus Christ if man, Jesus is just a man. But God can't be one with them. God can't be equal with them. That man can't be worshipped. That man can't be omnipotent and uh, forgive sins and do all the things he does. So in First and Second Timothy, Paul's doctrine of Christ emphasizes both Christ's divine and human natures. Paul's belief in Christ's divinity is seen in reference to Jesus as Christ Jesus our Lord and as our Lord Jesus Christ. On the other hand, Christ's humanity is seen elsewhere in Paul's writing to Timothy. So according to uh, 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6, we have one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. He appeared in a body, 1 Timothy 3, 16, and descended from David in human genealogy, 2 Timothy 2, 8. In addition to all this, the three great events in the earthly life of Christ are referred to briefly in these rather short epistles of First and Second Thessalonians, right? Uh, Christ's death, or I mean, um, First and Second Timothy. In uh, Christ's death is referred to in Second Timothy two eleven. His resurrection in Second Timothy two eight, and his ascension in First Timothy three sixteen, right? I forgot to highlight that one. I'll fix that later. I always try to put all my Bible verses in uh, easy to find colors. So that when you're looking up these verses later and making sure I'm telling you the truth, that you can find them. So 1 Timothy 3.16 is not done. Give me a second and I'll fix that. And I will when I post the PDF after the stream, it will be corrected. Also, if you're new here, I find my spelling errors and other errors like this typically while I'm live on stream. I do proofread them, but for whatever reason, I, I don't have the ability to find them unless I'm broadcasting. So there's a reference that a second coming to judge the living and the dead in 2 Timothy 4.1. And the attribute of divine judge is an attribute of God, but Paul ascribes it to Jesus. Again, you have verses in the Bible that present Jesus as a man and verses in the Bible that present him as a God. Okay? And it's interesting to note that Paul, who believes strongly in the doctrine of the Trinity, and had much to say about in his other epistle about the person of the Holy Spirit, did not say much in his epistles to Timothy about him. In both letters to Timothy, his salutations mention God the Father and God the Son, but they do not include God the Spirit, even though it's clear Paul believed in God the Holy Spirit. Paul does refer one time to the Spirit's revelatory work that he's, he's uh, given us information about the future. Noting that the Spirit is explicitly says that the future some will fall away from the faith. Thus, his work on Revelation, spoken in other Pauline epistles, is not overlooked in the pastoral letters. Uh, Timothy and Titus are pastoral letters, right? You know, they're they're like a pastor writing to his missionaries that he put out in the thing. So he mentions the Holy Spirit here. He mentions that the Holy Spirit can reveal things. And Paul's epistle to Titus contains one of the strongest statements in all of scripture regarding the divinity of Christ. 
There is no question that Paul believed Jesus to be co-equal member with the divine trinity. In Titus 2.13, Paul calls Christ Jesus our great God and Savior, after which he proceeds to briefly mention his substitutionary atonement for our sins. Jesus was the one who gave himself up for, to redeem us from all wickedness and purify himself, purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. And then Titus 2.14 again, he says, the need of the unsaved for redemption or freedom from all of the lawlessness deeds, all lawless deeds that they performed is their unsaved state appears. This concept of redemption has as background uh, the need of ancient slaves for freedom from their master. Our master was sin, right? To become, and we were set free to willingly become bond servants of, of a new master through Christ, right? Paul in this manner briefly but clearly states both that he believed Christ to be uh, what he believed Christ to be and what has uh, provided for those who would accept him by faith. So he's laid this out in his, in his epistles and it's, it's impossible to miss. Unless you're reading the Bible trying to miss Paul talking about the Trinity, you can't do it. Even in Paul's discussion of salvation, he affirms the truth of the Trinity. The agent of salvation in accord with the other pastoral officials is said to be God our Savior three times. Timothy or Titus 1, 3, 2, 10, and 3, 4. Again, no highlighting, Bill. You're failing. Uh, let, me, let me highlight this quickly. Sorry. Doing some editing on the fly, right? Come on. All right, that'll be fixed in your PDF. In Jesus Christ, our Savior, two times in Titus 2.13 and 3.6, the entire Godhead, and especially the second person of the Trinity, were and are directly involved in the salvation of humankind, according to Paul. Since Jesus is Lord, he shares with the Father qualities like deity in Romans 9, 5, holiness in Hebrews 4, 15, co-creator in Colossians 1, 16, and co-regent presiding in power at the Father's right hand, Acts 2, 3, Ephesians 1, 20, Hebrews 1, 3, where he, Jesus, intercedes for God's people, Romans 8, 34, and from whence, as the creed states, he will return to judge the living and the dead, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8. All of this shows that Paul accepted that Jesus was both man and God. He was not man, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and just here, he was a man who had all the attributes of deity, as well as all the attributes of humanity. Now, we want to talk about, did the Anti-Nicene Fathers uh, teach the Trinity? And Anti-Nicene is this big word, okay? There's a lot of early church fathers. Some of them wrote before the Council of Nicaea in 325. And there's a whole bunch of volumes that have the Anti-Nicene Fathers. And then the fathers that were contemporaneous to the Council of Nicaea or wrote after it are in a whole nother bunch of volumes called the Early Church Fathers, right? So... It's a, uh, what's it, 24 volumes, I think, up there on, on the shelf. But they break out there. So it's basically anybody that wrote before 325 AD is an anti Nicene father, right? And post Nicene father is PNF, right? And, and, but they're all grouped together as early church fathers. <laughs> okay, it doesn't make any sense. So let's just look through some stuff, right? And it says, but in truth, all are not figures, but there are also literal statements, nor are all shadows, but there are bodies too, so that we have prophecies about the Lord himself, even which are clearer than the day. For it was not figurative that when the virgin conceived in a womb, nor a trope did she bear Emmanuel, meaning God with us, right? That is Jesus, God with us. That's from the Anti-Nicene Fathers, Volume 3. And I'm giving you the page references. You can go look them up. These these volumes are available online. You take the the 
uh, way I've got the references down, you can put it in your search engine and find these quotes and see them in context. It says, Father, certainly in all respects, the Son of God and, and the Son of Man, being God and man, differing in no doubt according to each substance in its own special property, inasmuch as the Word is nothing else but God and the flesh is nothing else but man. Thus does the Apostle also teach respecting the two substances, saying, who was who was made the seed of David? A, in which words he shall be a man and the son of man. Who was declared to be the son of God according to the Spirit? In which words he will be God, conjoined in one person, Jesus, God, and man. Again, Antinicene Fathers, Volume 3, page 28, right? You, you just... Could it be clear that he's teaching the Trinity here? Here's another one. O oh, Jesus, man slain, dead, buried, Jesus, God of God, and Savior of the bring us the dead to life and heal us those who are diseased. And then I'm just doing the yellow because I need to get through this. Okay. Jesus who did rest from the toil of the journey as a man and walk upon the ways as God. Okay. Him walking on the water, he's God. Him dying, he's man. This is what the Trinity teaches. Thou who art only begotten, that he's the only son of God. Angels are called son of God. Adam's the son of God. Uh, born again believers are son of God. The only son of God who was begotten, not made, who came through the virgin is Jesus. That human Jesus was born, not created like Adam, right? And he's begotten, the firstborn of many brethren, God of God, most high, man despised until now, Jesus Christ who overlooketh us not when we call upon thee, who has been shown forth in all thy human life. Okay? Again, showing the humanity of Jesus, the divinity of Jesus in the same chapters. Right? The same paragraphs. Oh, wait a second. I think I'm back. Oh, I put the wrong slide up for you guys. Try this one. Okay. The Antinicene fathers also held to the person of the Holy Spirit, right? Look at in yellow. The Holy Spirit, who is the purifier of what is invisible, right? And then uh, the Holy Spirit the giver of life, the, that God, the God that in one substance in his essence and three persons in his attributes. This is Anti-Nicene Fathers, volume 10, introductory notes, right? Anti-Nicene Fathers. This is the Vatican manuscript in the Anti-Nicene Fathers, okay? Clearly talking about here, okay? And then I'm going to give you one, and you can read it. This is a... Um, fairly long, but it's a declaration of faith in there. Do you see the words Trinity three times in the declaration of faith? And you can read the whole thing, right? You know, what do you got? The image and likeness of deity, efficient word, wisdom, comprehension, constant power and formation of all of creation, the son of the true father, invisible of invisible, incorruptible, incorruptible, immortal of immortal, eternal of eternal. And there is one Holy Spirit. I mean, this is the doctrine of the Trinity written out. This is volume six in the Anti-Nicene Fathers, right? So when people tell you that Constantine brought this doctrine into the church at the Council of Nicaea, they have not read the material. And I'm telling you, the number of people that get out and think they can teach on this stuff, that don't bother reading the actual books, it, it's meant, right? You know? So, Gregory, I, and I good luck pronouncing his, his last name, that my I don't, I, I, these Greek names are horrible. He writes a long explanation of the Trinity. This goes on for pages, okay? He's an anti Nicene father, but he's closer to the Council of Nicaea in time frame. Look at what's in yellow. The Lord sends his disciples to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit without contradiction. That implies a communion and a unity between them, according to which there are neither three divinities, 
nor three lordships. But while there remain truly and certainly three persons, the real unity of the three must be acknowledged. Okay, the next section in let yellow. That there are indeed three persons, inasmuch as there is one person, God the Father, and one the Lord uh, of the Lord the Son, and one of the Holy Spirit, yet there be only one divinity. There is one substance in the Trinity. Oh, there's that word again. And there is one Lord the Son, and one Holy Spirit, and we speak of one divinity, and one Lordship, and one sanctity in the Trinity. And the Father is Lord, and he the Son is also God, and God, as it said, is the God is Spirit, right? This goes on for pages, right? In in Gregory, he's very uh, detailed. You would think somebody wrote this uh, a couple weeks ago. This is this is, you know, uh, before the Council of Nicaea. I didn't look up his date exactly, but he's probably early three hundreds, right? We therefore acknowledge one true God and one first cause and one Son, one very God of God, possessing the nature of the Father's divinity. That is to say, being of the same substance with the Father, the same what of the Father. And one Holy Spirit, who by nature and in truth sanctifies all and makes divine, makes divine as being the substance of God. So those who speak of either the Son or the Holy Spirit as a creature we anathemize. Anathemize is to curse. We damn them. Okay? We, 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 anybody that says that the Son is a creature or the Holy Spirit's a creature, that they are a creation of the Father, this is the early church father saying they need to go to hell. They're, they're here. They're, they're cursed. They're damned. We acknowledge that the Son of God was made a Son of Man, having taken to himself the flesh of the Virgin Mary, not in name, but in reality that he is both the perfect Son of God and the perfect Son of Man. That's what the Doctrine of the Trinity teaches, that Jesus possessed in the Incarnation all the attributes of deity and all the attributes of humanity. He set aside his use of some of those de attributes of deity. He set aside, you know, he says in his ministry, he does nothing except for by the power of the Holy Spirit. He clearly could have done it in his own power, right? Now, look at the green. Again, he's contradicting the people that are going to teach you error. Some have given us trouble by attempting to subvert our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by affirming of him that he was not God incarnate, but was man linked with God. Okay, this is the early church heresy. He's talking about, he's saying they, they try to come in and bring this trouble. They're wrong. For God, having been incarnated in the flesh of man, retains also his proper energy, pure, Process possessing the mind unsubject, unsubjected by uh, natural and fleshly afflictions and holding the flesh and the fleshly motions divinely and sinlessly and not only unmastered by the power of death but even destroying death and it's that it is the true God incarnate that has appeared incarnate the perfect one with the genuine and divine perfection and in him, there are not two persons. This is another early church heresy that Jesus had was two persons inside of the one body. No, he's one person, but that person contains two natures. In God, there's one nature and has three persons. This is why this is not something you can find an analogy in your, in your workbench and say, oh, God's like this, right? Him who is the true Son by nature and the Son of Man according to the flesh, our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, do you think Gregory has made his point here that the doctrine of the Trinity is what the early church taught? Like I said, I'm, I'm, I highlighted just highlight to this because this is so good. But the Son also is God and being the true image and the one and only divinity according to the generation and from the nature from which he has from the Father, there is one Lord, the Son, but in like manner there is Spirit who bears over the Son's Lordship to the uh, creature that is sanctified. And is the Son both before the Incarnation and after the Incarnation? The same Son is both man and God. Both these together as though one. 
again, yellow correction. God, the word is not one person and the man, Jesus, another person. They're getting rid of this. A son who is in nature God. Wherefore, the Trinity is to be adored to be glorified. The Trinity is a resolution of an apparent paradox in Scripture. It's not a paradox in itself. It's an explanation of the paradox. It's the solution of the problem. Right? The Holy Trinity is to be worshipped without ever separation or alienation as taught by Paul. The saint has defined the, Trin the Holy Trinity naming God, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And this is the end of his thing. But you see how long it goes on. It's all showing the Trinity. This is anti-Nicene fathers. Right? So you got these people going online that uh, got their uh, theology degree on Google. Okay? And still haven't figured out how to use it. Teaching that Constantine came up with the doctrine of the Council of Nicaea. And I've lost how many counts of how many video shorts come up in my um, Instagram post on this nonsense and, and that. Emperor Constantine, they say, um, changed Christianity by convening the Council of Nicaea and introducing pagan ideas of three gods. The Trinity doesn't teach their three gods. So that's absolutely incorrect. And uh, the Council of Nicaea was convened to deal with a number of issues, but mostly the heresies taught by Arius, okay, a bishop. And he says, books were removed from the Bible at the Council of Nicaea. The canon of scripture was not even a subject. Hear me. What books belonged in the Bible was not even a subject discussed at Nicaea. You can look up this stuff. The Council of Nicaea, what they discussed, all that. These records are available to you, right? Before the Council of Nicaea, most of the books of the Bible were settled. There were a few still in, in dispute out there. Was Second Peter there? Was Second and Third John really there? There were a the few books that were in question. There was a couple books, like First and Second Clement and the Shepherd of Hermes, that were suggested by some church fathers might be in Scripture. In fact, some of the early copies of the Bible we have have them in there, and they ultimately fell by the wayside because they lacked apostolic authority. They lacked connection to an apostle in the New Testament. So they fell. Doesn't mean that the uh, Shepherd of Hermes or, or uh, First and Second Clement teach anything wrong necessarily, but they didn't have. Clement wasn't working directly with an apostle Peter or any other apostle writing. Okay, and they said, well, this is an important book, but it's not scripture. Okay. Now, one book that you'll hear a lot about is the Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch was not considered scripture by the Jews. It was included in part of the books in the Septuagint. I mean, it wasn't included in the Septuagint either. Sorry. There are some Apocrypha books, books called the Apocrypha. Apocrypha means hidden. Okay. Apocrypha means that you wrote them and put somebody else's name on them. The Apocrypha are Apocryphal books. But there's a whole bunch of other apocryphal books that aren't part of the apocrypha. This gets a little tongue-tying for you. The book of Enoch is an apocryphal book. It wasn't written by Enoch. doesn't claim it was written by Enoch. It was written in the Second Temple period, probably 250 to 300 BC. Enoch been in heaven for a long time. The book of Enoch conflicts with the Bible uh, in a number of ways. The book of Enoch is in Scripture. It doesn't mean the book of Enoch is not important ancient text. Okay, does it mean, uh, you know, that other books, third and fourth Maccabees, aren't important texts, but they were never considered scripture. Now, first and second Maccabees were part of some of the early Bibles. Okay, those are Old Testament books. That's the Apocrypha. You you want to read the Apocrypha? Get yourself a Catholic Bible or a Greek Orthodox Bible, and they will contain them. The Greek Orthodox arranges them differently. So you're going to think you have more books. But there's actually only two additional books in the Greek Orthodox Bible and the Catholics. But just understand this. No books were removed from the Bible at Council of Nicaea. It wasn't even a subject. This take you 15 minutes Googling this stuff to find out these guys are talking out their butts. Okay? Now the sources where you can read about 
what subjects were discussed at the, at the, and what decisions were made. When you read the early church councils, Eusebius gives a general description of what was described. He actually talks about the councils, what they discussed, what they were done, right? And uh, like I said, I've included a link um, below, but before my library was burned, I had very old books that contained the same information. And and so this idea that these are uh, uh, these are corrupted versions of the Bible you're getting, and corrupted versions of what's out there telling you the books weren't removed, are are false, right? And I the the Council of Nicaea disputed or dealt with Arius's claim, right, about Jesus. They rejected it, and they discussed it, and they ruled on what's called the rule of faith. And that rule of faith is Trinitarianism. So you get the uh, the uh, Nicene Creed that comes out of the Council of Nicaea, which affirms Trinitarian theology, but it's just putting into a codified form something that was already believed, as we see. Now, some early church heresies, these all have fun names, Ebionism, right? And from the Ebionites. Now, their leader was identified as this guy named Ebion by very uh, early uh, <laughs> heresiologists. These are people looking for heresies that write on these. Like Arrhenius, he's writing his book. It's called Against Heresies. You think his subject is heresies? He's writing it. So he tells you about this sect. The Jewish sect in the late 1st and 2nd centuries, they maintain the authority of the Hebrew Bible and thus held the necessity of observing the Mosaic law. These are the Judaizers that Paul fought with, right? Just going on. And they're on there in the Egypt Minor. And then Docetism, right? It's a heresy challenged the biblical testimony of Christ's full humanity, that Jesus was fully human. They wanted to say that he, he appeared human. He's God and, and just manifests. He's like, like you putting on your shirt, he put on a tent of human flesh, but he's not really flesh. He's not human. Ignatius of Antioch likewise warns against the erroneous views uh, when he warns the church at Ephesus in um, uh, to do not so much as listen to anyone unless he speaks truthfully about Jesus Christ. Okay, they're they're dealing with these people that are teaching heresies. Heresies were going on when the Bible's being written. Paul, Peter, and John all deal with heretical doctrines that are being taught in the church and refute them. This isn't something that waited to the 20th, 20th or 21st century to show up. The Gnostics. Gnosticism existed before Christ, but it was less unified in its in its thing but there were gnostic ideas they existed in the first century both paul and uh john deal with them but in the second century and the third second to fourth century gnosticism really kind of gelled and so that's where you're going to find these later uh church writers like Arrhenius and tertullian fighting against them in gnosticism the earth was created by not the god the real god but the God of the Old Testament is a demiurge. He's a lower God, okay? And actually, he's a lonely God that was doing bad things, okay? And, and so they do extensive defenses of the God of the Old Testament being the same as the God of the New Testament, fighting this in the Marcanite heresy. And Arrhenius responds to the Gnostic heresy by focusing on the foundational nature of both the Old and New Testaments as a work of the one true God, the same God. There's not two different gods. There's not a, a mean and nasty God in the Old Testament and a, and a nice, kinder, gentler God in the New Testament. And, the, and the, what do you call it? Gnostics tried to make that distinction. You'll hear people try to make it today. Now, dynamic and modalistic monarchianism. Doesn't this just roll off your tongue, these names, right? These are two errors are similar. And in a common, they emphasize the oneness of God to the detriment of God's personhood. Now, you'll see this coming out in a lot of people that are uh, like oneness Pentecostals, people that want to stick with the oneness. They're good with God as one, but they, they don't want to believe God has three persons. They argue against that. 
Now, Arianism, that's this Arius guy from the uh, Council of Nicaea, uh, he, he had numerous errors that he was teaching, but the first major view, right, that's there, he's the presbyter of Alexandria. He's a church leader. And in, in 313, he was t teaching that the Son was created rather than being co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father. Okay? That God created the Son, and the Son created everything else. You had, had anybody from the Watchtower Bible Society come and try to teach you that? This is where they get it. It's this Arius, okay? And that he's not ontologically. He's not the same what as the Father, right? And the Council of Nicaea convened to address this growing controversy. That's how Nicaea dealt with the uh, Doctrine of the Trinity. Doctrine of the Trinity was well established in the church. You had a guy teaching heresy in Alexandria and he defrocked him over it, right? Later, he's going to, through po politics, try to get back in. There's a big fight goes back and forth in the early church uh, where supporters of Arius try to get his position accepted. And Apollyarnas of Laodicea, now he's about AD 390, believed that in the taking on the human nature, the word, the logos, became united with the body only. So that the body, Jesus, didn't have a real humanity, and not a real human person. He's just like putting this on. And uh, Gregory the, um, Nazareth addressed this issue and related it to the heresy of docetism, stating that in this view, Christ's flesh was merely a phantom rather than a reality. So this is like I said, you'll hear these same stuff. There's nothing new under the sun. The same heresies that came up in the early church come right back out around. They repackage them and they resell them. They have no basis in scripture. Nestorianism, this is 5th century. This guy's from Nestorius at Constantinople. Again, leader in the church, right? Thought that Jesus was actually two distinct persons. And he, he struggled to affirm the traditional title for Mary as Theotokos. Theotokos literally means God-bearer. And you get people go crazy, especially Protestants, when Catholics refer to Mary as the mother of God. This is where the subject comes up. It, it's more of a, the title Mary, mother of God, is not an elevation of Mary. It's a, a statement that Christ in the womb as, as that fetus, was fully God in the womb. He didn't become God after birth, didn't become God at the, his baptism, nothing. That He was God in the womb. And that's what Theotokos is about. It's not saying Mary uh, should be worshipped, but that's it. But you get Protestants go, oh, you can't call her Mary, mother of God. That early church did, and they did it for that reason. And this guy was having real trouble with that idea because he didn't think that God could be in a zygote or a fetus or whatever he thought babies were as they were growing, right? Now, monophysicism. Wow, this is fun. And you took skin. I love these words. This heresy combines two natures of Christ, divine and human, into one. Okay? Now, this is where you get the, what's called the Oriental Orthodox Church. Most of you people have heard of Coptic Christians. They're out of Egypt. They're part of the Oriental Orthodox Church. After the Council of Nicaea, not the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Chalcedon, when there was um, the Chalcedon formulation of the Trinity explained that the two natures of Christ didn't commingle and they never were there. Uh, that's the first break in Christianity as the Oriental Orthodox Church went away in favor of this. Because their position is that the divine and the human became one person, one nature. Okay? And when Jesus died, God died, which is impossible. That's why it's rejected by the rest of the church. But they held that position and they're my brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? I believe Coptic Christians that are trusting in Jesus for their salvation are going to heaven. Just like any Methodist or Presbyterian or anybody else on the planet. But they separated from the rest of the church over that issue. And that's when it happened. Now I know I'm already over time and I don't want to get into Michael's thing. So I'm going to quickly put on a song. I'm going to look through the chat. If there's anything I can answer quickly, I will. 
And if not, I'm going to get out of here and uh, let me put e Lauren E back on here. I love that thing. I just downloaded it a couple days ago and uh, I'm going to play this till you're sick of it. I'll be back shortly. You be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. He says you put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And there'll never come a time in your life where Satan decides to leave you alone. Satan attacks you because you're God's child and he hates God's property. Satan attacks you because you're the light of the world and he's the prince of darkness. Satan attacks you because you're the truth and he's the father of lies. Satan attacks you because you're a soldier of the cross. You're anointed. You have the word of God. You have covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. God has given you authority. Use it so that you can have victory and peace in this life. And if you say you want to live victoriously and abundantly and yet you don't pray, then I don't believe you. Because prayer is how we live in the abundance of our God. You can never exhaust God's resources because He can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think. You cannot exhaust God's power. Our God is an awesome God. He is full of grace and truth. He is of the Almighty El Shaddai, the conqueror of death, hell, and the grave. He's the conqueror of sickness and death. He's the conqueror of powers and principalities. He's the conqueror from Calvary. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the Lord of glory and is coming soon with power and great glory. This is about the eternal souls of men and women. This is about your sons and your daughters. This is about the future of this nation. It's time for those who name the name of God to suit up and show up. This is a fight to the finish and I intend to win it with the help of Almighty God. Do you want it? Then fight for it. Do you want it? Then fight for it. cut Lauren off a little bit at the end on her final uh, closing out, but I do want to get out of here. Please head over to Cloud Hub or Rumble or uh, wherever, YouTube, and let's pray for this nation, the United States. We we definitely are in a, a battle, and I see the comments from Stacks about the uh, new age twist, the old age, and, and how witchcraft twists the idea of the Trinity. So does uh, Islam. Islam will tell you about the father, the angel Gabriel and Muhammad, and it's wrong to say that because they're not equal. And they try to make that the same as what we're saying about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Or, you know, the devil, the antichrist, and a false prophet as some kind of trinity. They are not. They're three distinct beings, okay? Not of the same substance. So they try to confuse the truth. You take the skin of the truth, you stuff it full of with a lie. And that's what the enemy does. So with that, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to try to close down, and then I'll see you guys over there in the prayer for the nation, hopefully. Okay. Thank you.